Yes. We're going to talk Sorry. about a beautiful people, why we picked that title last week. Verse 1 in review. Likewise you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, talking about if any of the husbands obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Amen. So it's saying, you women, Christian women married to unchristian men. Now, the Bible teaches we shouldn't be unequally yoked together. God is not against a black man marrying a white woman, an Hispanic man marrying an Asian woman. Uh, nothing, there's nothing in the Bible. I had a woman one time call me, her, um, I forget if it was her son or daughter. Uh, one of them was white wanted to get married to an Hispanic, said, could you share, I was pastoring at Full Gospel yet, she said, would you share with me some verses to share, I think it was her son, with my son uh, about mixed marriage? And I said, well, I'd be happy to if there were any. Hmm. The only verses uh, against mixed marriage are in the Old Testament regarding the race of the Jews. God wanted them until the day Jesus was born to be a pure race, not to intermarry. And none to do with color, and none to do with anything. God wanted a race of pure Jews up until the time Jesus came. Outside of that, there is no scripture teaching that there shouldn't be any interracial marriage. Uh, however, there is a scripture talking about marriages that shouldn't occur. And in the Christian community, we ignore it all the time. Yes. Uh, it said, what light has uh, what fellowship has light with darkness is saying that a Christian should not marry an unbeliever. Right. Yet we do, uh, the church is full of it. And what do you do? You love the people and pray for the um, uh, married partner who's not saved. Um, because once they're married, they're married. And you pray that God will bless that marriage. But it's not a wise decision. Hopefully, the Christian wins out. Mm -hmm through prayer, mm -hmm. and the unbeliever gets converted. Mm -hmm. But the risk is, the unbeliever will win out, and the other will walk away from their faith. So, mm -hmm. Paul said, Christians should marry Christians. Yeah. And um, this woman, th these women he's talking to, were married to unbelieving men. Doesn't mean they married an unbeliever while they were a believer. It could mean they were both unbelievers when they got married and she had gotten saved since. We don't know. We don't have the background. But one thing is certain. If you have a, a couple where an unbeliever married a believer, continually pray for that unbeliever. The woman herself, if the woman is the believer, has a game plan. Paul gave it to her, or Peter gave it to her here. Live your life in such a way that even though your husband ignores the word, he will see in you a playing out of the scripture that will begin to win him over. And so that's what he's saying in verse 1 here. And verse 2, what wins them over? As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. So Christian wives can see their non-Christian husbands come to know Jesus when they voluntarily submit to them. Verse 3, in a Christian way, no wife should submit to being beaten up. Mm -hmm. No wife should submit to being beaten up. I have never told anybody ever to divorce anyone. That's a very personal decision. I would usually advise against it. However, if there's an abusive husband, I have told women, get out of the house. Don't live with a guy. You don't know how bad he's going to hurt you next time. Yeah. Yeah. Get out of the house and refuse to even go to dinner with him until he's been in some kind of therapy with a therapist and that therapist is telling you I'm seeing great change in him because he's dangerous. Don't put your life at risk or your health at risk. Uh, I don't say divorce him. I'm saying get away from them. Yeah. Pray for them, continue to pray. Maybe they'll get saved. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not the final judge, but I don't think any man who beats up his wife is a Christian. Yeah. I, just, I have a hard time wrapping my brain around that. 
Uh, anybody can do something stupid once, but an abusive person by habit, uh, I don't see it. I don't see that that's a Christian. But Peter said, here's something you can do to help win them over. Um, and then he went into the idea of beauty, verses 3 and 4. Wives must not let their beauty be something external. Now we guys like external beauty. Girls like external handsomeness. My wife took one look at me and said, God, do you see what I see? Well, she must have seen something. Yeah. Something like that. But... Um, God said, all that's wonderful. Doesn't matter how pretty or how handsome your mate is, if they're a beast inside, if they're a horrible person, if they're lazy and won't work, there's a lot of things. Doesn't matter if they're good looking. What matters is if, 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 if they have an inward beauty. And so Peter is now uh, advising the women, become beautiful inside. He said, uh, don't let it be something external. Beauty doesn't come from a hairstyle, it's gold jewelry or clothes. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. And I put down there where Jesus said in Matthew 11, 29 and 30, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now, I put that there to show you that what Peter is advising the women to work on is their inner person, pattern it after the inner person of Christ. Jesus said, come here, I want you to learn about me. Here's what I want you to get, I'm meek and lowly. He said, if you get that, You'll find rest for your soul. So, he's advising the women to be beautiful inside. Now, Peter is talking to the wives. Jesus was talking to men, the disciples. So the same truth fits both. Don't get all caught up in how you look on the outside. But develop an inner beauty. Something that is beautiful to God. And that's a meek and mild spirit. Alright, so, verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted God adorned themselves being in subjection under their own husband, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, again, we shared last week, it wasn't just that. It wasn't that Sarah went through a whole wife saying, Oh my Lord Abraham. How's my Lord Abraham doing today? As a matter of fact, the only time in the Genesis account there is any mention of Sarah thinking of Abraham as Lord, which means master or head, not master like a slave owner. The only time we're ever seeing a recording of that thought passing through her head, it was a, actually a thought passing through her head. She wasn't talking to anybody. An angel without talking to um, uh, Abraham and saying, this time next year, you're going to have that child, you and Sarah. And Sarah thinking, man, I'm old and my husband's old and my Lord is old, she said, in her mind. And that's the thing Peter is referring to. But then we also shared last week there were times that Sarah did what all women of all ages do. She put her foot down. How many of you ever had your wife put her foot down? Let's not go there. Yeah. And she said, get that bond woman and her son out of here. He will not be an heir with my son. Her Lord Abraham was shaken in his knees. Said, oh God, what am I going to do? I love Israel. And God said, Abraham, calm down. I'm going to bless Israel. But I do want all the attention in your home on Isaac. So I will take care of Hagar and Ishmael. Do what Sarah said. God Almighty who said, let there be and there was, 
looked at Abraham, the man he entered into covenant with, and said, do what the woman says. You should be shouting amen. Do what the woman says. So it, it's not an actual case where Old Testament women were afraid of their godly husband. There should never, ever, 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 ever be a time when a wife is afraid of her godly husband. Ever. But as we talked about last week, the idea is somebody has to be able to break a deadlock. Every organization, including the organization of marriage, when, when the sides can't come together, someone has to have the final say, and God said, I've ordained that someone to be the man. And if the man is wrong, like in Abraham's case that I shared with you, God will say, no, in this case, listen to her. How many of you think God can still say that kind of stuff? No, he can't. All right, so now we're going to move on. So the beauty there is the beautiful people. We ought to be beautiful inside. Now I'm going to tell you something. You should have seen me when I was young. I mean, I was no better looking then than I am now. <laughs> Can't do anything about it. It's the straw that I drawed. Drew. Drew. There you go. I draw. I draw the straw. It's the straw that I drew. Uh, life dealt me its hand, but I can do something about who I am inside. And so we talked about being a beautiful people. Now he goes on. Today's lesson, last week's lesson, was chapter three, verses one to six. Tonight's lesson is chapter three, verse seven a. Through 7b, through 7c, through 7d. When I got to studying this, I think there's four distinct things he wants to talk to us about regarding the husband and the wife. So even though we treat this as though there are four separate verses, it's one verse with four separate parts. And I got them all up there on this uh, 7A. I should have put uh, through 7B there as well. But then I break them down. A, and on the back we got B, C. Instead of verse numbers, I got letters. Yeah. All right. So, verse 7 reads this way. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them. Who them? Dwell with your wives. You husbands, dwell with your wives. According, according to knowledge. That's A. Dwell with them according to knowledge. B. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. C. As being heirs together of the grace of life. D. That your prayers be not hindered. Now, <laughs> Adam Clark of all my commentaries in my Bible programs, he would strike me as the most legalistic. So it amazed me what Adam Clark had to say about this subject. He said, the female has what the man wants, beauty and delicacy. The male has what the female wants, courage and strength. The one is as good in its place as the other. And by these things, God has made an equality between the man and woman, so that there is proper, properly very little superiority on either side. This legalistic man, I would have figured, would be hammering you women submit. The church my wife and I held a revival in the first year we were married in St. Paul, Minnesota. Later, when that pastor moved, he called us and said, well, I'm leaving. Why don't you come try out for the church? Mm -hmm. I thought, I don't want that church. Oh. Legalistic, the women couldn't wear slacks. My wife is dressed like a sinner tonight. Oh, wow. So Danbrook, for that matter. Oh. Uh, <laughs> pants on. Shame on them. I'm dressed like a sinner. And the thought, and I... 
I'm just going up there, there and I had already uh, begun to understand grace. I was in the beginning stages of understanding grace. And um, I thought, I don't want to go up there. When I went to full gospel 30 years ago and preached for them three or four times, well, they were examining me to decide whether or not they were going to offer me to the church uh, for voting. As long as you don't play it, right? I preach grace and I preach right. it hard because it's what I do. But grace is a funny thing. People don't get that you're preaching grace right away. They think it sounds great. But as they continue to hear it, then all the legalism comes up in it and I say, oh no, 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 it can't be all that way. It can't be all that way. And uh, I had a guy tell me at Full Gospel, okay, we get grace, you've taught us grace, now put grace in your back pocket for later. I thought, have you ever read Paul? Show me where Paul put grace in his back pocket. Every subject he talked about, he encircled with the doctrine of grace. Whatever it was. When he taught how Christians should live, he taught it from the framework of grace, not law. You never stick grace in your back pocket. It ought to invade every sermon at some point. So we didn't want to go up there. We were friends with folk already from a couple of revivals we held. And uh, so when we took the church, they said, oh, we're not legalistic. We, we don't judge other people. We just don't believe God wants us to wear slacks. We knew better because they had criticized some visitors that had came in slacks. So I preached grace for one year. And then we had a church meeting. And I said, I'd like to vote out the bylaws you have. The main thing that the pastor taught was women being subject to your wives. Don't wear men's clothes and be sure to tie. Those were the three main doctrines. Over and over. The way Paul was over and over great. Pastor Ranger was over and over in those three things. And so... They said, we just feel God's convicted us. A year later, they voted to do away with those bylaws. And I kid you not, the next day, every one of those women had jeans on. Not new ones. Yeah. Yeah, but don't come in with the dress, Pastor. <laughs> I got beautiful legs, I'll tell you. But the, the point I'm getting at, thank you. <laughs> the point I'm getting at is it appears they had some of those jeans put away in the back of their closet. And uh, so they didn't have a personal. I'm going to tell you something. I have some personal convictions. As I get older, I realize the Bible doesn't necessarily denounce drinking in moderation. But it's a personal conviction of mine. And it doesn't matter what anyone teaches. I might even amen something they say, but I'll never take a drink. It's a personal conviction of mine. And people don't change your personal convictions unless they're out of whack and they're corrected by proper doctrine. So the fact that these women maintained for the first year we were there that Oh, we don't judge other women. We just think we should wear dresses. And the very next day, they all had jeans on. So, my point is, what is my point? Flesh is weak. Grace. My point is, grace changes people, uh, but you can never put it in your back pocket. It should be taught over and over. and every, When you're teaching something hard, like the list in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, uh, that says, uh, talks about people's uh, grave, grave sins. Um, before he brought that out, he brought grades out in verses 16 and 17. Always wrap grace around tough teaching. Always. All right, now, 
So he said, husbands, let's look at A first. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Now, the Cambridge Bible says this. In those relations, men were to act according to knowledge, with a clear perception of all that marriage involved and of the right relation in which each of the two parties to the contract stood to the other. The wife was not to be treated as a slave or a concubine, nor again as the ruler and mistress of the house, but as a helpmeet in the daily work of life, a sharer in its highest hopes and duties, the mother of children to be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Absolutely, the partners in all the everyday things. One of them has the power to break a deadlock. What's offensive about that? We shared as we talked, uh, as we've been teaching on this, um, the week before uh, a beautiful people, we shared the fact that people with authority in the kingdom of God are to serve the ones they have authority over. How's that offensive? My wife can testify if I go in the kitchen to give me a cup of coffee, I say, honey, I'm in the kitchen, can I get you anything? That title, on, on a Sunday morning, in Paul's writings to Titus, that title was made up because that's something the Lord convinced me of, I'm to serve her. I'm not to be served all the time. I'm to serve her. And uh, I think she would testify on my behalf that I do my best um, to um, make sure if I'm already in the kitchen, she doesn't have to get up and go in the kitchen. But anyway, I hope so. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I wasn't going to go on until you said amen. <laughs> <laughs> what are some ways that husbands can dwell with their wives according to knowledge? A wife is a helper together with her husband to accomplish the goals of a marriage. She can understand that, that she's his helper to accomplish the goals of the marriage. What might be some other way, not mentioned in the Cambridge Bible notes about there, uh, I think we husbands should know their motivational giftings in Romans 12, 6 to 8, and the natural abilities God has given them, and we should learn to know their strengths and their weaknesses. And you hear me say it all the time. If the wife is better with money, give her the checkbook. Mm -hmm. Find out what she does better than you. Mm -hmm. That's what I did in my life. And, um, she fixes up a lot better than I do, I know that. But, uh, and yield those things to her. You know what a boss, the president of a bank does? He finds out the giftings that the people working directly under him have, and he ties them into the spots that makes the bank function better. That works. Right? Yeah. It's to his benefit to have somebody gifted in an area to work in that area. That's to the bank's benefit. And it's to the marriage, the benefit of the marriage as well. All right, put that page over. Example, oh, I already said that. If the wife is better at managing the money, give her the checkbook. B, giving honor onto the wife as onto the weaker vessel. David Guzik says this, In this context, weaker speaks of the woman's relative physical weakness in comparison to men. Men aren't necessarily stronger spiritually than women, but they are generally stronger physically. As Peter brought in the idea of the woman's feminine nature with the words, the wife, he continues in appreciating the feminine nature and how a husband should respond to it. And then he goes on and says, Therefore a godly husband recognizes whatever limitations his wife has physically, and he does not expect more from her than is appropriate. You know how my wife ticks me off sometimes? We go grocery shopping. And we put some heavy things in some of those bags at Walmart and some lighter things in other bags. And I keep catching her trying to grab the heavy ones. I'm 617 pounds. She's 52 pounds. Yeah. She has no business grabbing the heavy stuff. So, 
Are women generally weaker than their counterpart, the men? Generally, yes. In every case, no. Barbara had someone she works with, the women lifting weights, she could probably beat me up. Her name is Barbie as well. And that Barbie could probably beat me up. I don't know. I'm old. Uh, maybe when I was young, I could have taken her. I do not know. Uh, there are women gym rats, just like there are men gym rats. And they're pumping that um, those barbells and everything else all the time, and they get very physically strong for a woman. However, I want to point something out. There is a controversy these days in the news, these days, where men who decide they are really women haven't went through the whole transgender process yet, but they have identified as women. And now, because of political correctness, they're competing in track against physical women. These physical women are very good at these races. They train all the time. And suddenly, two mediocre men that weren't winning anything in track of men are bringing home the medals because they're competing against born women when they are born men. The truth is, the world number one woman golfer years ago tried, uh, they invited her to compete in one of the PGA men's tournaments of golf. And she came in, several of the men, uh, this is the best woman golfer at the time, and several of the men beat her. So, is every man strong and every woman, a woman ever, <coughs> ever, absolutely no, I'll get it out. Absolutely no. There are some women stronger than some men. Would you put men and women who do the same thing, the men who are gym rats and the women who are gym rats, the men are going to whip more away. God made them that way. The whole skeletal system is different. Nothing wrong with it. So he said, understand the woman is the weaker vessel. In today's world, women would be offended at that. They stick up for these transgender women. I was watching the news and somebody said, well, they were born men and a transgender woman who had once been a man was on the panel on the news channel and said, nobody's born a man. Really? thousands of years of history and now the enlightened crowd of today figures out nobody's born a man it takes four five six seven years for that child to figure out if he's a boy or a girl That's... even so come quickly lord jesus amen it's a crazy world out there it is God created them, male and female created He them, Genesis tells us. This woman said, nobody's born a man. Male and female created He them, God said. Mm -hmm. God creates men and He creates women. Right. And then this world messes them up. And that's sad. So there's nothing here that should be offensive in that we ought to understand that generally speaking, the man is superior in strength. Let him do some of the heavy lifting. Now, there are a lot of women taking care of husbands in wheelchairs. Now the women are stronger. Sickness, disease, birth defect, something has hindered that individual man and he needs help. Mm -hmm. And the woman's stronger there. Mm -hmm. So he should yield to the strength of the woman in that case. But generally speaking, men are stronger than women. And so Paul's saying, understand that, or Peter rather, 
It's saying, understand that and give honor unto her as unto the weaker vessel. It's not insulting her, it's not saying weaker in some other area. Most of the commentaries agree it's talking about physical strength. All right. What's the main point here? In the majority of cases, men are stronger. There are exceptions to every rule. Um, my wife and I knew a couple who did roof work, the Gathwaites. The wife was shorter than Barb. Yet she could carry a bundle of shingles up that ladder and run around that brook and keep up with her husband. She was a freak of nature. I had a hard time. I helped them one time. I had a hard time getting a bundle of shingles yeah. up a ladder. A this little woman under five foot tall put that thing on her shoulder and run up that ladder and run all over that brook with her husband. <laughs> So there are freaks of nature. Now her, she wasn't as strong as her husband because he did the same work. And so his muscles grew in the same area hers did. But when it comes to work work, she was stronger than me. Going up and down a ladder with stuff on your shoulders. So there are uh, exceptions to every rule. The, then there's C. Now it talks about how our wives as being heirs together of the grace of life. A man's attitude toward his wife should recognize, this is the uh, Believer's Bible commentary, a man's attitude toward his wife should recognize the fact that she is a fellow heir of the grace of life. This refers to a marriage in which both are believers. Though weaker than the man in some ways, the women enjoy equal standing before God and shares equally the gift of everlasting life. Also, she is more than her husband's equal in bringing new physical life into the world. I've uh, never seen a man do half the job a woman does in giving birth. Never seen it once. So, so what he's saying here, even though the man has been given the authority by God to break deadlock. In every other way there's equality, except in the giving birth. The women shine forth there. But uh, other than that, they're every bit as saved as we are. They're going to be every bit as rewarded as we are. We do not outshine them in any area whatsoever because of our sex. I'm not going to get more rewards in heaven because I'm a man. My wife's not going to get any more rewards in heaven because she's a woman. We'll get rewards for what we do. We get saved by grace. We get rewards by what we do. It has no, God has no interest in whether you're man or female in that arena. None whatsoever. You'll be rewarded for what you do. I tell you, first responders, I wonder how many of the 400 and some, I think it was, that died on 9-11 were females. You know, their lives matter just as much as those men. They're running in there just like everybody else. Uh, there's just so many ways that women have done amazing things in the world. Um, and uh, their reward, they should uh, have the same uh, acclaim that any man doing such a thing should have. Because they're putting their life online just like the men are. Nowadays we have an army full of women soldiers. I personally don't like that. When there's a war I'd rather see the fathers go off and the mother be with the children than the mother go off and the father with the children. I'm old fashioned. I just think that's more natural. Um, but it doesn't matter what I think. The world is what the world is today. Yeah. And those women that go off and leave their families behind, whether I think that's wise or not, the bottom line is they're every bit the hero any man is that has done the same thing. Total equality in those areas. But what he's getting at here, what is this grace of life that we are uh, fellow heirs of with our wives? Ephesians 3, 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. There's that phrase again and of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. So we non-Jews 
now share the same promise as the Jews have, the promise of eternal life. Um, Titus 3, 7, being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Hebrews 1, 14, are they not all talking about angels? Ministering spirit sent forth to minister for, for them who shall be heirs of salvation. This idea of heirs together of the grace of life is talking about the grace that brings us eternal life. When the Bible talks about life, often it's talking about eternal life. Life that never ends. And the woman is going to spend just as long in heaven as I am. And guess what? Up there, there will be no deadlock to be broken. When Barb and I get to heaven, there will be no me being the head. There's no need. There will never be deadlock again. Yeah. There will be perfection. Right, that'd be great. She won't be trying to outmaneuver me. I won't be trying to outmaneuver her. There won't be anyone who uh, streets they, of gold. They don't have husband and wife in heaven. No, we won't be married in the sense we are now, but I'd be very shocked if we weren't best friends forever and ever and, and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. All uh, right, but uh, we don't know how all that works. Mm -hmm. uh, so a man ought to recognize that the wife in every way has the same promises that he does and the same gift of eternal life. All right, now, we are all heirs of the inheritance that God has provided for children, which includes Christian husbands and wives. Is the wife a secondary heir of the grace of, uh, the grace of life? Romans 8, 17. If children and then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs of Christ, and so be that we suffer with them that we may be also glorified together. If a woman is a child of God, then she's a joint heir with Christ. And I'm going to tell you something, if she's a joint heir with Christ, she doesn't much care if she's a joint heir with me. She's a joint heir with the big guy, Jesus himself. And so she inherits all that Jesus inherits and uh, because of the cross. And uh, that's the blessing of eternal life. Uh, and then I wanted to include, Albert Barnes had an interesting note. Under every other system of religion but the Christian system, woman has been regarded as in every way inferior to man. Christianity teaches that in respect to her higher interest, the interest of religion, she is every way as equal. She is entitled to all the hopes and promises which religion imparts. She is as redeemed as he is. She is addressed in the same language of tender invitation. She has the same privileges and comforts which religion imparts here. And she will be elevated to the same rank and privileges in heaven. And I've not been a student of other religions, but I found Albert Barnes' comment crazy, I mean, uh, not crazy, fascinating, that according to Albert Barnes, who was a scholar, he said under every other system, women are inferior to men. Every other religious system on the planet. Women are inferior to men. And I'm going to tell you something. It's tragic that there are Christian churches in America where women are inferior to men. And that ought not to be. Women are in every way are equal, but in every institution, someone has to have the power to break the deadlock. And God said, that'll be the husband. But, what does the husband get in return for having the power to break the deadlock? He's got to serve his wife. Jesus said in the non-Jewish world, in the Gentile world, those with authority lorded over them. Won't be that way in my kingdom. You want to be great, you got to serve. You want the power to be the head of the house? Serve your wife. You won't remember this tomorrow, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Bob Streble told me one time, he said, you can preach anything you want when you're single. Once you get married, you got to remember, you will be reminded of what you preach. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And then D, the last part, 
that your prayers be not hindered. What's Paul teaching us uh, husbands here? Some have thought, according to um, uh, Guzik, and I put some brackets in for uh, clarification purposes. Those brackets aren't in his comments. Um, but David, David Guzik said, some have thought that Peter has in mind here the prayers that husbands and wives pray together, but since he addresses husbands only, and because it, in other words, the scripture, it, the verse, says your prayers, he here refers to the prayers of the husbands. Now, some commentaries disagree with that, but that verse is talking to husbands. So he's telling the husband, there's no doubt, let me read that verse to you again. Verse 7, Likewise you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, who does that, the husband, being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers, who he talking to, you husbands, that your prayers be not ended. I agree with David Gusick in that. He's saying, men, if you don't treat the women right, you're going to have a harder time getting your prayers answered. You're going to have a harder time getting your prayers answered. Robertson said, Husbands surely have here cause to consider why their prayers are not answered. So if husbands are praying for things and not getting them done, this is one area we need to examine. Are we respecting our wives? <coughs> Are we respecting our wife? Because Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said if you don't do that, your prayers will be hindered. All right? So, what's Paul teaching? Mention that. Here's the answer. When we, in position of authority in the home, fail to serve our wives, our prayers will be hindered. If you want your prayers answered, then treat your wife right. Now, again, Jesus, when he said, it's not going to operate that way in my kingdom. You want to be great, you serve. He used himself for an example. The head of the wife is the man. The head of the man is Christ. The head of Christ is God, the Bible teaches. So what did Jesus do, the head of man? He said, even as I came not to be served, the... the uh, King James uses the word minister, it means to serve. Came not to be served, but to serve. And lay down my life for the many. So the head of mankind said, I have authority over man. How do I respond to that authority? I come to serve them, not to demand that they serve me. How's that fit into tonight's lesson? A lot of men demand that the wife serve them. Jesus said, the people I have authority over, I'm not demanding that they serve me. I am serving them. Excuse me just a second. Uh, Brother Hannah, that's profound. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. So again, at the bottom, we got the names of the last eight lessons of the 11 that we've done. I might have to go and rename those first three. Uh, every, every one of the last eight had started with the word A and ended with the word people. Uh, so anyway, I don't know how long that'll go, but that's what's happening right now. We'll you mean see I should have said that? They now, the reason we call this a functioning people, he's telling us how marriages ought to function. Our marriage is not to function. That's why, uh, but not just uh, art, not just marriages, relationships of all kinds function when we respect one another. Right. Friends, fam, other uh, areas of family, uh, we need to respect one another.